Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today I will be talking about very important peripheral that is used on all embedded systems across different platforms and devices. I'm talking about interrupts. This topic is fairly large, so for the first time this part of the video will be scripted to ensure coherency and good pace. After introduction and explanation I will guide you to over the example I have prepared for you. You can also skip this part if you want to go to directly to the code examples and functions. Timestamps will be in the description. Another term you will hear in the documentation is ISR, which stands for the Interrupt Service Routine, which basically means function, aka routine, executed as an interrupt. Interrupts in and of themselves are not a peripheral, but more a special signal inside of most microcontrollers. However, these signals are processed by an integrated peripheral on most modern processor. In the case of ARM, embedded series M, it's called NVIC, which stands for Nested Vector Interrupt Controller. This integrated peripheral receives different input signals within the microcontroller and processor core and then with additional parameters decides on what the processor should do. A lot of times the functions that are executed by specific interrupts are called ISR, or just an interrupt function, but in code you will find mostly as a peripheral underscore RQN. The function being triggered by an interrupt or an exception can also be referred to as interrupt exception handler. Because of the nature of how this function is executed, we cannot really say that interrupt functions are called, like a programmed call would be, but rather invoked. Invoked by an NVIC because of an interrupt signal that came to NVIC. As the name suggests, NVIC is a built-in peripheral in most Cortex processors that handles interrupts. As a core peripheral is somewhat fixed by the core designer, therefore the documentation is universal for all ARM Cortex devices. I will be showing you and linking pages regarding NVIC and other documentation on interrupts. The term nested as the first letter of the NVIC means that a number of interrupts can be defined and given a priority number, where zero means the highest priority, and that this interrupt cannot be interrupted by another. The lowest priority value is somewhat variable, like I started before the peripheral is somewhat fixed. Different manufacturers like ST, NXP, Microchip, all that include ARM Cortex cores, can choose to implement different number of priority level or bits that are available from the maximum of 8. On this image, you can see that two different microcontrollers from different companies have different amounts of priority levels or bits to set. So for your st 32 microcontroller, you can check this information in the reference manual by going to the NVC chapter, in my case I have a 407 VG uh, on my discovery board, and it's chapter 12, and reading how many levels of priority it supports. You can see that for my microcontroller it says 16 uh, priority levels, which means it has 4 bits of priority able to set. The last term vector refers to the way the processor finds the program or function to execute when receiving an interrupt. This is by having a vector table or a list of all interrupts that are predefined for a microcontroller. Every vector entry is on a memory location or an address to the appropriate function in the memory that the processor needs to execute. You can find this table defined in your startup file for a microcontroller, it's the one that ends with .s, and you can find it in the core slash startup folder. And it includes definitions of all vectors for exceptions and interrupts. You can observe such a table, and you can find that some of these vectors are more universal than others across different microcontrollers. The first part are the core vectors, and they are called exceptions because they have negative place numbers in the table. That's because they're linked to the operation uh, and interrupts by the processor core, whereas others are external and thus called just interrupts. Number of these can vary and there are different amounts of external signals that can come from different amounts of peripherals that are integrated in your microcontroller. This is in the control of the microcontroller manufacturer. For st 32 you can see the vector table in the reference menu under interrupts and events chapter. You can see that this table is then saved at the memory location 04. So this is the first re reset exception. At 0, location is served for initial stack pointer. So only at 04 it can start and then 4 bytes for each pointer. NVIC remembers each interrupts like a number, like a position in the table, and then orders the processor to get that interrupt address number in the vector table, where the address is stored, and for that location it just jumps to the appropriate function, 
so this is the ISR interrupt handler or an exception. Before going forward, I want to talk to you about function calls and interrupts routines and how they compare as far as processors are concerned. I want to address this topic so you have some reference knowledge for the future and any additional reading. When we talk about code execution, function calls and interrupt routines, we have to discuss some core ideas like program counter, stack and stack pointer. These are important in understanding why interrupts work the way they do. Program counter or PC, or also commonly called the instruction pointer IP, is a core part of the processor and it holds the address of the next instruction. This is how the processor fetches instructions that need to be executed. Normally a PC is incremented sequentially from memory, but sometimes this value can be modified to be changed, so the processor sort of jumps to another location and executes something else that it should be. You can see where we're going. Now, the stack is a type of memory structure used in most operating systems and processing ICs. It's a part of the memory that stores all sorts of variables and parameters, so the execution of the program and its function can be dynamic and re-entrant. If a code would not have any functions and interrupts, so a linear code, then stack would not be needed. But because we want to use functions that we call multiple times, with different data going in and out of them, and we also need interrupts, there we need a stack. Stack is a LIFO type of structure, and I'm sure that you heard of FIFO, which stands for first in, first out. It's a common buffer type memory structure for storing data that is written and read asynchronously. Whereas LIFO, on the other hand, is, stands for last in, first out. This means that the last piece of data that was placed on top of the stack is the first piece of data to get off the stack. This way the stack breeds up and down, and the location of the next available data piece is stored as a stack pointer. This way, when we say the data goes off from the stack, we do not erase it, but we just move the stack pointer lower, therefore declaring the space above the stack as free. This way, the stack memory grows upwards in the same area where heap, which is a free part of memory, grows downwards. But that's for another time. So why is this nature of stack useful? Well, because this way we can store all local variables and parameters on top of each other without them interfering with one another. Let me show you an example. We see in this program we have a few static variables, global variables. We have two functions and two function calls and one function also calls the other. Different points in time or execution will be denoted by the program counter value PCX. In the beginning, the stack is empty. Firstly, the program calls function drawbox, with two arguments and a return value. In order to preserve those, processor will store those variables on the stack by their name, as h, w and return in this case. Next we want to jump to the memory location where this function is defined, but we do not want to forget where we left off. So to remember where we have to return to back when we finish executing this function, we load the address of where we left off on top of the stack. This address represents the program counter value before the jump to the function. Now we just have to allocate additional space for local variables of this function that we're calling, therefore reserving space on the stack for variables i, j and k. Now the stack pointer is on top of the stack, ensuring integrity of data below. The group of the data that we just put on the stack, including return value, arguments and local variables, it's called a stack frame. Sometimes in the function drawbox, the program calls function draw line. Therefore, without finishing function drawbox, we want to jump to another function. This is quite common. The processor loads up another stack frame for function draw line on top of the stack, and the stack pointer follows. Here comes the best part. Function draw line is not aware that it's being called by another function, and it's not aware of the variables inside of it, and in case of draw line, below them. This is why we can have the same local variable names as the function below it. In this case, it's the variable i. This is also the reason the function can be re-entrant, meaning multiple instances of the same function can be running on the stack, each one with its own separate set of variables without disturbing each other. This is the only way the function can access data below them on the stack is to use arguments that pass the reference to a variable instead of the value, so let's say a pointer in which case we want to use a higher stack function to modify the value of a variable in a function below it on the stack. Right after the function draw line finishes its execution, the data is popped off from the stack using the stored address to program that can return where it left off after calling the set function. 
When we say we popped off, we again mean that the stack pointer just changed its value to a lower one and therefore declaring the data above it to be free. Sometimes after this, function drawbox also completes and its stack frame also pops from the stack too. Now the stack is empty again. Therefore the stack pointer points to the beginning of the stack. Right now we can say that the data on the stack is still there, but if we were to fetch it, we could still get it. But the stack pointer is the one that declares which data is present and usable and which is empty and rewritable. Now you know how the stack works with regularly so-called planned function. And now we can apply this logic to interrupts. Looking from a program point of view, an interrupt is just another function with its own set of local variables, but no arguments or return value. For this example, we will add a few parameters to our processor. These are in the form of some kind of registers from R1 to Rn. These are certain CPU registers that are used for its operation, and their value is unique to certain points in execution of the code. Therefore, we will be backing up those on the stack as well. When an interrupt is invoked, we want to jump to that function that is pre-assigned to that interrupt, do whatever you need, and then go back to a regular program as if nothing had happened. We do this by copying the address of where the program was interrupted on top of the stack, adding these processor registers and then starting execution of the interrupt routine, also popping on the local variables of this interrupt routine. In this case, the interrupt routine has two local variables which are stored on top of the stack. After the interrupt routine is finished, we pop its stack frame from the stack, replace the current processor register, go back to the address where we left off. At this point, the state of the processor is the same as if we never left for the interrupt. This is the magic of interrupts. Of course, we can have interrupts call other functions and maybe functions that are already executing on top of the stack. Due to the nature of the stack, we can have reentrant functions with no problem, as they are not aware of each other. We can have a function executing and then having an interrupt invoked that calls the same function again. No problem. Processor will load up a new stack frame so that function on top of the stack is not the same as the one below. And when we finish the interrupt and its function, we go back to that function and continue its operation, as if nothing happened. This is in a nutshell how a program works, with and without interrupts. Of course, some parameters and information have been excluded from the explanation, so you know, if you want to know more, I will add some articles and videos in the description. Now that you know how interrupts blend into the normal operation of the program, the only thing to discuss is how to label and assign priority levels to different interrupts. We already talked about the available priority levels in a microcontroller. With our new knowledge of interrupt execution, we can also determine that interrupt priority on its other parameters. If an interrupt will be executed often, synchronously or asynchronously, the interrupt routine has to be short in order to take the least amount of time from the regular program. This does not dictate how important an interrupt should be regarding its priority, but does give us an explanation on the frequent heard advice that says that interrupts should be short. The worst thing would be if this interrupt was very long, happens very often and has a very high priority. With this, we can deduce that an interrupt with a high frequency of invoking has to be short in order to maintain that high priority. Therefore, for a lower priority, we assign interrupts that might take longer to execute or are just not that important. Just to be sure that give to low frequency interrupts the priority that they need. So maybe uh, assign priorities to less important interrupts give shorter interrupts higher priority than longer ones, so they can reach their appropriate deadline. Another functional peripheral is Cystic Timer. You probably heard of it. This is a 24-bit down-counting timer that is built into the NVIC peripheral. It is used for keeping system time and for triggering task schedulers for real-time operating systems. You could get Cystic to trigger its interrupt routine periodically to either increment a global millis counter or trigger the set AirTOS scheduler. This is how all STM32 projects created with CubeMX are initialized. Cystic interrupts is used to increment a global millis counter, which is used for timeout and delays functions of the HAL library. With an ARM Cortex, you are guaranteed at least one timer for system applications, so timing like AirTOS for including Cystic. Therefore, you don't need to rely on any additional timers implemented by the microcontroller manufacturer. A few words on NVIC documentation. Its documentation can sometimes be integrated into a microcontroller's reference manual or datasheet. 
In the case of STM32, only a small amount of microcontroller-specific information is provided along, like vector tables and the priority bits. I have worked with some old SAMD processor from Atmel, and I had integrated NVSC documentation. Therefore, it's a really manufacturer-specific case. So if your microcontroller documentation does not have NVSC documentation, then you can just access it on kale.com under core MC's documentation. The link will also be provided in the description. Another useful documentation is the format of an article on ARM's webpage that I found, and it's explaining the difference between two types of priority and configuration called priority grouping. These two include previously mentioned preemptive priority and new sub-priority. We have already talked about the first one, but not the second one. This is because even ARM advises against using the second one in most cases. The preemptive priority is just normal priority, as we were calling it up until now, and it's called that because it distinguishes between different interrupts on whether they can preempt each other, based on the priority level. The second one distinguishes interrupts between two or more with the same preemptive priority if they are pending, like if interrupts are disabled for a period of time and then when you re-enable, multiple interrupts with same priority level might be waiting. But this, however, is ill-advised and recommended you do not use by ARM. This is also important because preemptive and sub-priority bits are shared between the two. So if you only have four available out of eight, then they're split either 4, 0, 3, 1, 2, 2, 1, 3, or 0, 4. So this is selected with priority grouping. If we take a look in the HAL init function, we can see that by default S1032 are indeed configured with MVIC priority group 4, which gives all four bits to preemptive priority and 0 to sub-priority. Functions that we'll be using are called the NVIC enable RIQ in order to enable the set interrupt and NVIC set priority to set interrupt priority. And these are also used by the CubeMX and we'll be showing those two in the actual examples. With those two settings, we can enable NVIC to receive and acknowledge incoming interrupts from certain peripherals. So the next step is to configure the physical peripheral to trigger these interrupts from it. Usually you are able to set what kind of condition or status triggers such interrupt from a peripheral to NVIC. So you can see there are two parts to this story. You have to set up NVIC in order to receive an interrupt and assign its priority, but you also have to set up a peripheral in order to fire those signals on certain condition. So now it's time for you to show my demo program and how to set up interrupts on your STM32 from CubeMX or just manually will be setting back to the non-scripted live recording. And we're back to the demonstration part of this video. So as you can see on the screen, I have my project set up and my discovery board on my desk. If you take a look at it, you can see that I'm using all four LEDs where the blue one is the only one that is running in the while loop. All the other three are the result of their separate interrupts. As you can see, there are two additional wires going into the board and these are connected to my external UART interface. So we're gonna use PuTTY to send messages to this board. I'm also gonna be using Timer, which is connected to the red LED to trigger and create ourselves our own millis counter. And we're also gonna be using the internal sensor for uh, the accelerometer, which is in the middle of all the LEDs. And we're gonna using this one to trigger an interrupt in order to read the data from its registers. So let me show you how I've configured everything in the cube. So for this, I have configured firstly the SPI for the accelerometer and the pins for it can be accessed via the schematic pack for this discovery board. This chip is not the same as the one that I have on my board, but the pinout is exactly the same. So all the PA6, 5 and 7 are for SPI peripheral, PE3 is connected for the chip select and P0 is connected to the interrupt pin of this chip. So this interrupt pin will be connected internally for the data ready flag. So when the data will be converted and ready to be read, this pin will go high and trigger an interrupt. So the first thing we're gonna do is to enable this one. As because this one is connected to the P0, all the zero pins of all the ports are connected to the XT0 interrupt. So here we want to click this one and it will enable the interrupt for this one. For the chip select, I'm just using the pin that is connected to this microcontroller. For the UART over here, I have connected two pins that are available. 
so if we go to the connectivity and UART, I have configured it as asynchronous, so this is just normal configuration, and the parameter is for one, uh, 115,200 bits, only 8 bits and no parity. And I'm also using the NVIC settings over here to enable the global UART5 interrupt. So this will enable the local interrupt for the UART peripheral. This will not enable the NVIC peripheral. For that, we have to go to the system core, NVIC, and then manually tick this one. So it will enable this interrupt. Also for XT line zero interrupt. For the timer, we can go to the timers and I'm just using one that is available, in this case, timer five ticking the internal clock and configuring its own timer 5 global interrupt. I also take this one and make sure that it's also ticked in the NVIC settings because sometimes it's not by default. For the timer, for those who are curious how to set this up as a millis counter, well, we have to firstly see what frequency is going into this timer. And if we go to the clock configuration register, we can see that in my case, all the timers are APB2 timer clocks, or at least the timer 5 is. So in this case, the APB2 timers are connected to the two times the frequency of the APB2 peripheral clock, 84 megahertz. So if we want to get 1000 kilohertz out of this, we firstly divide this by the maximum round number that we can, or in this case, 8400. So the timer will be receiving a frequency of 10 kilohertz. If we want the timer to roll over every millisecond, we also have to make the counter count to 10. In this case, the counter will roll over every millisecond, therefore rolling over 1000 times a second, putting out a 1 kHz update interrupt. We want to make sure that the trigger event selection will be update event, which means every time the timer overruns or something like that. Also in NVIC settings, enable it. In the NVIC setting, you can also observe some additional settings that we also talked about. So you can see the priority group can be selected over here. In this case, by default, it's four bits for preemption and zero bits for sub-priority. You can also click this to show only the ones that are uh, enabled. And in this case, you can see that the hardly enabled, so you cannot disable them, are the system ones. So in case like system timer and Hartford error. Now let me show in the code where these settings are applied and how you can do it yourself. So for the XT interrupt, we can go to the GPIO init function. And in the last part over here, here is the local peripheral initialization of this pin. So this pin is configured as interrupt rising. So this is the local designation, meaning that this pin will be connected to an interrupt. Now, in order to enable this interrupt from the NVIX point, we have to fire these two functions over here. One sets the priority and one enables the interrupt. And if you go into one of these functions, which is how NVIC enable IRQ is just a mask for the NVIC enable IRQ. And same for the function set priority is just a mask for the NVIC set priority. It just does a little bit of overhead from uh, selecting a priority group from preempt and sub priority altogether to give it the proper priority number depending on your settings. So it's a little more universal. So you don't have to think about it that much. For timer five, we can go into the timer five in it. And this one is a little bit hidden, but actually inside of time five base init is call of the function, which is defined over here, which is how time base MSP in it. And this one enables the timer and also enables the interrupt for it as well. The same can be said for UART5. So if you go to UART5, inside of the hull UART init, you can see that here is where it calls the hull UART MSP init. And if you go back to the UART, this is this function over here, which just checks all the pins and enables the NVIC set priority and enables the interrupt. You can access these interrupt routine functions when they're configured in the core source and the one that ends with IT. And this one houses all the interrupt functions. So in the beginning, we have all your defines and then the core interrupt functions like Hartford handlers. And if you go to the bottom, the last one is the SysTick. You can see that the already here is the hull increment tick. And if you click on it, you can see it's adding the tick freak, which is just a macro if you go back. And this is a macro for number one. So all the way over here, this is how increments the timer. If you go back, so this function increments the global variable by one. 
So here are our own interrupt handlers. This first one is the external zero. So this is the one where when it goes high, triggers this interrupt, meaning that the data on the accelerometer is ready to be read. So first thing I do is toggle the LED so I can see it visually. Then it calls the HAL XPRQ handler. So this is the HAL handler for handling all of the things for interrupts. And then I'm reading the data from two different registers. In this case, the Z axis data, filling it into an array and then combining these two values into one big 16 bit value. And we can observe this value later. To show you how I also configure this accelerometer, in case you have this board, we can go to the datasheet for this accelerometer. You can see that the out register is on 2C and 2D. So this is where I'm reading the data. You can observe that a few configuration register can be uh, altered. So in this case, there are six of them and we're going to be conf uh, configuring the register four and three. So if you go down, the register four in this case has to be entered because these four most significant bits enable the sensor itself. So in this case, I've configured it as 12.5 Hertz output rate. So these two bits are at one. Uh, by default, it's powered down. We also want to enable these three axes. By default, they're already enabled, but when you write into the register, it's gonna overwrite if you don't have this set at one in the incoming data as well. The next register we want is the number three. So the register number three is the one that actually enables the interrupt for the sensor itself. The first one enables the data ready signal and enables it so it's wired to the interrupt one pin. Then we need to set this interrupt to be high when the interrupt happens instead of low and then having it interrupt signal paused. This is depending on how you configure your own microcontroller interrupt but for my case I want to have it paused and be high when the interrupt happens. We also want to enable interrupt one pin with setting this pin one as well. In the beginning, I want to reset the chip in order to erase any settings from before. So the first thing, I only write one to this register in order to soft reset it. And the next thing that I write is this one not zero, but this one on one and this three on one as well to configure it for this operation. You can see this in the beginning of my main code. So here I have declared all the addresses for these registers. I have configured all the registers data and then I'm writing all the data here I'm just resetting that uh, bit and then writing the data for three different registers. I was before using the control register 5 for testing, but it's not really necessary. I'm also reading the data from the chip and in this case reading the ID register in order to confirm that I'm indeed talking to the chip. Other interrupts include the timer 5 that we can configure and I'm using this one exactly the same as the cystic one, just a little more bare bones. I have a global variable called my millis and I'm just incrementing it by one. In order to start the timer, you have to firstly call the hull time base start, but in case of interrupts, you have to call the one that has underscore IT. In this case, you just start the timer and enable the local interrupt uh, trigger. For the UART interrupt, we want to trigger it when data comes into the uh, receiving registers. But I had a few problems doing this with HAL and I can show you also another web page where another man had the same problem with this and having some function lockup and this is the same thing that I observed. It triggered the first time but then it locked up and didn't want to trigger anymore. So I'm doing this manual way. I'm configuring the interrupt for the UART directly from the main. So the first thing I do is just send this text called happy and with a new line and carriage return. So I'm sending this text to the terminal and then I'm enabling the bit in the control register one that says the uh, receiving bit. So if we go to the control register one, the control register one is the one that is responsible for this. We can check this by going into the data sheet for my processor. And if you scroll up, this is the control register one and the bit five on the bottom over here is the receive uh, register not empty. So the bit five is the bit that sets the receiving not empty uh, register interrupt. So when some data comes into the UART peripheral, the, uh, the said data register is not empty, which triggers a flag. And this flag will also trigger an interrupt. So we're getting an interrupt on the local settings for this peripheral for data coming in. After I've configured these things, I want to enable the SPI peripheral using low level driver 
and then start the timer as said before. This is just applying the settings for the uh, accelerometer and then there is just the while loop. So only thing that happens in the while loop is toggling of the LED. So everything happens in the interrupt routines. So the, the memory reading is done over here from the accelerometer. The millis counter is over here. And then for the UART, it's over here. So again, I toggle one LED, in this case is the green one. And then it's the whole UART handler. And then I just read the data from the data registers of the UART5 peripheral and then put it back into this register so the UART will send it right back. Because if you remember, UART uses the same data register for incoming and outgoing data. So this should just throw back the data that we type into the terminal. So to demonstrate this, I'm just gonna pause, reset it, and then I'm gonna open PuTTY. And I have also already configured it for my USB interface. And if I start the code, you can see it wrote happy and a new line and carriage return. And now I'm typing on the keyboard, typing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. And you can, as you can see, this is directly going in from the microcontroller. Well, we can confirm this because PuTTY doesn't actually uh, type whatever you're typing on the keyboard, it's just blank. And I can confirm this by going this to the side and enabling my debug window. And is, if you can see here on the right, we have all the live expressions going. So the UART is the one that is over here. So this UART buffer variable. And if I write A, you can see A, A S D, S D, F G H J K L. So you can see that all numbers are coming into the microcontroller, being saved into UART buffer which is already pushed back into the data register to be sent back to the UART into the computer. For the accelerometer, you can see the raw data over here. In this case, it's 16,800. And if we go and say that this accelerometer has a 16-bit resolution and it's plus minus 2G, so divided by 2, and then 2G divided by this number is the resolution per bit and multiplying it by 16... 1800 it says that it's 1.025 g's in my room right now which is a little bit over the actual data but it's not calibrated because it also has some offset uh, registers and calibration values so if i were to the trouble to use this accelerometer to get absolutely uh, consistent and accurate data then i could do that but for demonstration this is clearly working as you can see all the data is being refreshed all the time so here you can see the low and high bits uh, for this uh, register and then combined into the 16 bit over here. Your buffer is being refreshed over here. So if I type into the console, you can see it being refreshed. And the millis counter, my millis over here, well, it failed to expression. This is sometimes happens in this ID. So if I just write it again, you can see it's being refreshed. And as you can see, it's almost the same value as the UE tick, which is the one being incremented by HAL. And it's because the cystic timer starts a little bit before our timer because the cystic is in it initialized over here and our timer is initialized and started over here. So there's a little bit of gap, a few microseconds, I'm sure. And then we can see it's roughly the same. So 1,607,000. 1, and here it is. This is the demonstration of all the interrupts actually working. So nothing is actually going on in the while loop. Everything is going on in the interrupt routine. So I hope this video was very informative for you so you can start your own uh, project with interrupts and set everything up. And again, like in my case, when HAL or something else doesn't work, you can just read the data sheet and do it manually this way. It's really no problem. So thank you for watching and I'm gonna see you in the next time. Bye.